Fred, most quantum physicists recognize the weirdness, the strangeness about quantum mechanics, but wind up pretty much with a materialistic world. You start as a, a, a theorist in quantum mechanics and wind up with a dreaming universe. How does that happen? Isn't it amazing? I mean, I wonder myself, which of us is really in the right track and which is really maybe a little bit crazy? Uh, if you really get into quantum mechanics, uh, as I think as much as I have, there is there's a certain point where you reach that either you feel a growing frustration and you say to yourself, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to look at that part of it anymore. If I can calculate with it and it gives me the right answers and when I take enough averages, right. I see gross matter behaving like gross matter should be, which is very gross, yeah. then I would say, I don't care what's really going on at that quantum mechanical level. And if you tell me at the quantum mechanical level that there's some mysteriousness going on there, I'm not interested in that. And if you tell me that somehow the mind can affect matter, I don't even want, I, not only do I want to know that, I'm going to, I'm going to deny it because what I want is a causal, orderly world, in spite of the fact that we live in a chaotic, very a-causal world. All right, so, so what are the specific areas of quantum mechanics that you find so fascinating and so strange, and then how do you look at it differently? It, it can be said very simply. Quantum physics makes predictions in a very rigorous way, but the thing that's being predicted is nothing material. What's being predicted is a possibility pattern, right. a waviness, which does not exist. In fact, it exists in an imaginary space or in a space which requires group theory to even figure out right. what the heck it's doing yeah. or in a Hilbert space of an infinite number of dimensions. It's a space of, to me, I think, very magical. But so when you deal with what it predicts in that space and you see how really good it is at making predictions about that, and then you see that there's a simple operation that takes you out of that space into this space, and that operation is simply multiplying what that stuff, that funny stuff is by itself in a time-reversed manner called psi star psi in the yeah. language of quantum physics, yeah. if you will. And from that, you get probabilities, which are the real probabilities you get from shaking that dice, right. and it comes up, you know, and you get the right odds, and you calculate everything, and it looks like, you think, wow, wow. And so I say maybe the reality that we should be thinking about in quantum physics, and the thing that fascinates me, is that infinite realm of possibilities, that thing which is be beyond the simple operation of squaring or multiplying something by itself to get where you're at. People are content, for the most part, using it to predict things that we can see. But what I'm interested in are the things that we can't see, the things that we can't hear, the things that we can't smell or can't But taste. are those things real, or are they not just the probabilities that didn't happen? It's very interesting when you look at it in terms of reality and things that don't happen, because if you take it absolutely seriously that what's real cuts out everything that is not real, supposedly not real, that other probability stuff, you come up with the wrong answer. You must always consider the other possibilities. In other words, what doesn't right, happen right, sure. influences right, what does. Right. And if you tend to leave out what doesn't happen, then what happens is you get the wrong answers. So physicists have been really, that's the frustrating part. If you're a determinist and if you're a, an absolutist and you, you believe in causality, it, it frustrates you because it, it simply says it can't work that way. So traditional causality, you're calling into question? It, it has to be called into question. The, cause, the, the causality that works is at the level below this, this level. At this level, it's probabilistic. At that level, it's very causalistic. But the thing which is behaving in a causal, logical, lawful manner isn't anything real. <laughs> well, <laughs> what, what is not anything real? Which piece? 
It's this thing that you multiply by itself to get probabilities. That's from those probabilities, you determine average values. From average values, you determine properties. And from the properties, you determine what we measure in the physical world. Okay. Let me give that to you. What, would, what are the implications? What are the implications about the reality that you and I see here together, the reality of this table, the reality of our lives? What this seems to be implying to me is that this, as hard as it appears, is fundamentally an illusion. Secondarily, it's very real. Fundamentally, it isn't. The fundamental level, I believe, that God creates a lawful universe, but it isn't this universe that's lawful. It's that other sub-level where the real law is going on. And I think most physicists are beginning to see that because they're looking for a deeper level. For example, in string theory. Well, they wouldn't be using the word God. So. No, no, no. It doesn't matter. You can use yeah. God, you can use the master equation or conscious. I don't know what you call it. Uh -huh. They know there's something else which is not the material level. For example, I mean, the, the first inkling is what's matter? Well, uh, protons, what are they? Well, uh, quarks, well, what are they? Uh, well, then there's... Well, what we know for sure, the, the more you slice it, the more you have empty space. Exactly. There's very little real stuff when you really look at it. But it's structured real space. That's what's so intriguing to us. It's structured, and we have a way of getting to that structure through the equations of theoretical physics. And they're very brilliant. They're wonderful to work with. They're amazing. They give wonderful insights, but they don't have anything to do with the reality that we see at the primary level. At a secondary level, we know how to get from the primary to the secondary, but at the primary level, we're dealing with something which is abstract, obtuse, seemingly... Contradictory, counterintuitive, all, all that. Every, everybody agrees with that. It, it seems to be, but it really isn't contradictory. What's contradictory is when you try to interpret it from this level. Yes. Then the contradictions pop up like crazy. Right. But right. when you're at that level, no problem. Right. But getting back to why then is what we see here illusory? What, what is an illusion about what we, our microscopic world? Okay. If we are materialists in our thinking and yes. we look at things logically and rationally, then we insist that we have a causal behavioral world, a world that works according to laws that we can understand. In fact, we escape from the caves looking to control our environments, and that's what science really came from, the ability to try to control. So if we're in a situation where we can control everything absolutely, everything I told you about this primary world would be nonsense. But the problem is we can't. There's something probabilistic about this level mm -hmm. that's fundamentally probabilistic. It's not probability because we are not taking into consideration all the other possibilities. It's probabilistic because we can't take into consideration all the other possibilities and all those other possibilities cohere in ways to produce the things we can pay attention to. And unfortunately, when we get to that result, we find something we understand, it doesn't fit a causal mechanical world view. That's what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is all about. Then from that position, how do you then generalize and encompass the whole universe which you characterize as a dreaming universe? Dreaming as, as everything's illusory or everything is, is, is connected in some way? Let me tell you, when I began to travel around the world and speak in various locales, one of the things I learned about was that different cultures have very different views towards what's real right. and what's unreal. Australian Aborigines don't see this. They also think in a way like I'm <laughs> describing. This is not the fundamental reality. You were born in the wrong place. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, so they deal with something they call Alcharinga or dream time, as, as it was named by some anthropologists at the turn of the 20th century. But it really is a more fundamental reality. And when, it, when I heard that's what they were thinking, I, I would ask them, well, wh how does the universe get created? It was dreamed into existence. And then I heard them tell me a story. And the story they told was a story of evolution, how the great spirit dreamed, and from the, great, from the spirit he dreamed of fire, and he dreamed of air and water, and then he liked the dream so much that he <laughs> crunched it together into matter, and 
then uh, he was getting a little tired of the dream, so he started to sleep a little bit, and he passed the dream on to the first living organism, fish, <laughs> uh, for them, fish. Yeah. And then fish went on to the next living organism on land, and then land to eagle, and uh, ending up with kangaroo, and then finally... <laughs> The human, the human, <laughs> who walks the earth, and and all the other animals have to. It, it's the story of evolution. It, it better than Darwin could have said. I mean, you know, in fact, there is a whole part of Australia called Darwin, isn't there? So, to me, this said to me, maybe dreams are more fundamental as well. Maybe dreams are a way of looking at this fundamentality. Because after all, why would they come up with this? Where would that come from? Uh, so the dreaming universe, uh, as I got more into it, uh, it, it began to kind of make sense that if we look at ourselves as human beings and we look at what we go through to get born and we examine what has been studied about rapid eye movement, REM, during the first stages of, uh, of, 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 of being in, in uterus, uh, whatever that's called, uh, we can actually see that as soon as eyes and brain have formed, the eyes are doing REMs, their rapid eye movements, indicative, I can't prove this, but indicative that there's some kind of mental processing going on akin to what we do when we dream, because we dream, our, we move our eyes back and forth. How long, how much of a fetal life is spent in that stage before birth? Almost 18 to 20 hours. Oh my God, there's a lot of dreaming going on there. When they were first born, that starts to cut down to the time when we're about three years old. I think it cuts way down to about uh, less than eight hours or something like that. And finding that as adults, you and I, we may dream three to three and a half hours a day where we're doing that kind of dreaming. So it led me to think, why would we be dreaming? What is there about dreaming that's so vital to our being, to our being this. And it dawned on me that possibly the dream is the way that we connect with reality. That, for example, there's rhythmic movements probably going on inside of the mother, and the dream could be a... And from that comes a sense of something's going on, something out there. But the dream is the realization that... That's going on out there. Uh, Jonathan Winson has done experiments with rats <laughs> in which he's watched to see how their neurons work. And what happens is when a rat goes scurrying around to try to find food and then goes to sleep that night, his dream patterns are exactly the same as he was scurrying around when he was awake. So I, we're not so much different from rats in that sense. <laughs> so it's very possible that what the dream is is a method by which we develop a sense of in here and out there. So that's why I began to think maybe the dream is, is more primary, that that's where information loading starts. That's where we can begin to process, where we begin to learn how to process. And most importantly, we develop a sense of presence of personhood, an ego, uh, a person who then is developed from that. For example, if the... And the woman burps or something like that. Maybe the kid you know, is disrupted by that. And that rhythm, when he's born, may be something he doesn't want to hear again because it's disruptive. So he may be nervous about, you know, I don't want to get into all that. But basically, that's why I think dreams are important. So from the illusion of the physical world to a dreaming universe, how do we do it? The idea here is if we look to what the Aborigines of Australia have told us and if we look at what modern medicine has told us about REM sleep of the fe in fetal development, it appears that the dream is a way of developing a sense of separation, objects, a sense of something being there. So it seems to me that if we live in a world of objects that are there, that possibly the level below that, the level of this quantum mechanical ooga booga <laughs> weirdness stuff, may just be a dream in which objects are materializing through the processes of the dream unfolding itself. And that's where I think there's some exciting things to be looked at. So that would mean that dreaming is more fundamental than what we think is reality. 
according to what I've <laughs> just said, the dream is more fundamental than the so-called real world. 